Okay, so we're now recording. So this is a photograph of Malaney, Malena and Tenny, who are both pupils at a local school in Lancaster, and they're participating in Black Lives Matter protests that were held in June in Lancaster uh, in Dalton Square. And this photograph was taken by their best friend, Bella, who's my daughter. Um, and the, here they are in Dalton Square, which is a square we all know, many of us very well, filled with beautiful Georgian houses, as well as this very grand Victorian town hall. But what was these young Black Lives protesters didn't know uh, is something else about Dalton Square, which it was, it was a home to a significant beneficiary from plantation slavery, a man called John Bond, um, who lived at what was then number one Dalton Square. It's a property that doesn't exist today. It was actually knocked down to make way for the town hall. But John Bond was twice mayor of Lancaster and he inherited his very grand Georgian Dalton Square house, along with Yelland Hall in Carnforth, 18 shares in the Lancaster Canal from, um, from his uncle, Thomas Bond. So John Bond lived from um, 1778 to 1856. John also inherited property and plantations in the West Indies, including around 700 enslaved people in Demerara and Berbice, uh, which are now part of uh, Guyana. Um, so the will of Thomas Bond um, showing this property, including enslaved people, is held in the Lancaster archives. And Amy has been working on transcribing this extraordinary will, which is giving us new insights into uh, Thomas Bond's life and what was inherited by John, his nephew. I began exploring this hidden aspect of Lancaster history in about 2018, when I, after I began exploring Lancaster connections to the center for the study of the legacies of British slave ownership database, which is a public database that revealed for the first time the extent of British slave ownership in Britain. And here we have this man in Lancaster, John Bond, that nobody had previously written about, inheriting huge, what was equivalent of millions of pounds worth of money uh, in this period. So as like Alan noted last week, since um, January 2020, Lancaster Black History Group, which was formed after these protests uh, in, in Lancaster, the Black Lives Matter protests, have been working with the community to research the family trees of seven prominent Lancaster families connected to the slavery business. And by the slavery business, we don't just mean the transatlantic slave trade, the capture of enslaved Africans in Africa, and their transportation to the West Indies and Americas. We also mean the wider slavery business, which is what happens to those kidnapped Africans when they're taken to colonies and plantations in the West Indies and their lives and, and the connection of Lancastrians to that trade. Um, so as I noted uh, when I began, the group that's been looking at the Bond family in Dalton Square is a group from Cornerstone community in Dalton Square who are part of Lancaster Methodist Church. And they include Marie, Amy, Sandra and Simon. And they've been undertaking their own research guided by Sunita Abraham, who's here today, uh, and myself looking at some of these hidden histories and how we can surface them. And in particular, what we're going to focus on today is these connections between Lancaster and uh, Guyana. Okay, next slide. So along with the involvement of the transatlantic slave trade, in the 17th and 18th century, Lancaster was heavily involved in trading with the West Indies and America. Lancaster traders and merchants developed extensive commercial routes, such as um, going to Guyana, which you can see on the left map circled, um, and they imported slave produced products such as mahogany, sugar, dyes, spices, coffee and rum, and later cotton for the Lancashire mills from plantations and exporting fine furniture, gunpowder, woolen and cotton garments. Young men from Lancaster families such as the Bonds worked as agents and factors across the West Indies. This gave rise to new wealth and power in the city. 
As Eric Williams details in Capitalism and Slavery, which was published in 1944, slave traders and West Indies merchants and their descendants dominated local politics political life in towns such as Lancaster as aldermen, mayors and councillors. Over generations, some of these families accumulated land and property, plantations and slaves in overseas colonies. Some of those who inherited overseas properties didn't want to actually travel overseas, um, so they preferred lives as gentlemen and women at home. These families sometimes employed local Lancashire men, those seeking opportunity and fortunes, sending them overseas to work as overseers and managers on the inherited properties and estates. In this talk, we'll be exploring some of Lancaster's connections with cotton and sugar plantations in Guyana. You may be familiar with Demerara sugar, which is something you can pick up quite easily in the local supermarket. Um, and it comes from the area surrounding the Demerara River, which you can see highlighted in red on the map on the right. And the name Demerara itself actually comes from the word Dumaruni, which is used by the native indigenous people to signify the river of the letterwood tree. So it's effectively the river which is surrounded by a tree which is called letterwood tree, but um, which appears to have been predom a predominant feature in the area at the time. But the word is now synonymous with sugar, and that is because of the colonialization of the area and the later plantations which were built there. So this country is part of the Caribbean, but it's on the American mainland. Um, so it's quite un unusual in that respect. It's a while to get your head around that. So it's formerly a Dutch colony made of three areas called Demerara, Babise and Esquibo, and they were, later they were later folded into this new British colony of British Guyana in the, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, it was formerly a Dutch colony, but actually British merchants and planters and traders have been active and present there since at least the early part of the 18th century. It was termed a late colony, but it very rapidly transformed into a major sugar producer in the late 18th and 19th century, creating fortunes for those who owned plantations and enslaved people there. The wealth which poured into Britain from Guyana wasn't only a consequence of sugar, but of tax funded compensation for manumission. So, it, and this is where our Dalton uh, Square story began. So in 1833, the Slavery Abolition Act freed 800,000 Africans who were then the legal property of British slave owners. And many people, including Lancaster's John Bond, became millionaires overnight when the government legislated that taxpayers would compensate this already wealthy group of middle class inheritors, landowners, somewhat aristocrats for the loss of their human property on overseas plantations. A decision was made to offer compensation based on the assessment of the local market value of the enslaved people in each colony. And because there was a, an enslaved labour shortage in British Guyana at this time, because mortality rates are exceptionally high in um, Guyana, those who owned enslaved people there were more handsomely compensated than those who owned people in other colonies such as Jamaica. So uh, next slide, John Bond's uh, inheritance then included a cotton plantation in Guyana called Lancaster. So there are two, actually at least two Lancasters in Guyana and Amy and I have had quite a time identifying which plantation is which and which Lancaster is which. But John Bond's uh, Lancaster plantation was a cotton plantation and was in an area of Guyana called Berbice. Uh, located uh, at the mouth of uh, the Machia River. And in this map here, you can see, if you look very closely, uh, you can see Lancaster uh, on the map. Um, this map is from um, 1840. We think that this plantation first came into the ownership of Thomas Bond, uh, John's uncle, in about 1812. And we, we've been able to find out little bits of information about conditions on this plantation before it was owned by Thomas Bond. 
um, uh, in around 1796, it was actually visited by uh, an English physician called jo Dr. George Pinkard, uh, who described the Lancaster plantation as distinguished by the inhumane treatment of the enslaved people there. This is a place, he said, where cruelty had become contagious and the manager hardened in savage conduct and diabolical cruelty. And he tells a story, and you can download this book, it's free online, it's called Notes on the West Indies. Uh, he describes uh, an unbelievably horrific scene of uh, an enslaved couple, a husband and wife, who've, been, who've tried to escape the plantation and been flogged. Uh, and the man had died of his wounds and the woman was still bound to him uh, with iron um, chains uh, in, in a condition he described as so horrid and distressing can scarcely be conceived. Uh, he described this episode as one of the most shocking instances of barbarity he'd witnessed during his journey in the West Indies and his oh. letters were later used to support the case for abolition in Britain. So that's before the bonds came into ownership. But I think what we're going to try and do, what we're trying to do in our research is work out why this was called Lancaster prior to this uh, connection. And we've got some more evidence that Amy can talk about now about conditions when the bonds held the plantation. So planters argued that the profitability of the plantations relied on those people being enslaved. And there was a growing concern in Britain that the growing pressure on the government to make slavery illegal would result in the enslaved people abandoning the plantations they were forced to work on. Workers on these plantations were also treated unfairly, and the Fiscal's report explicitly illustrates the mistreatment that went on on the Albion plantation, which at the time was owned by the Bond family in Lancaster. Oh, while, the voices of, while the voices of enslaved people is often missing, the following extract that you can see on your screen, and which I'll quickly read out in a moment, um, is an extract from testimony from an enslaved female regarding the mistreatment of her sister and her sister's sick child on the Albion plantation in 1825. The driver thought proper to lay my sister down and flog her with a whip. The manager not only knew it, but saw the flogging. I was picking cotton. I left the field and went to the spot and asked the driver why he flogged my sister. He told me to go away and took his whip and flogged me also. I have the marks now across my thigh, which I show you. The manager got up, got upon his horse and rode away. So it's very clear that even when the um, when the bonds are in the plantation, that horrific instances like this are going on. And there are probably several more or many more that are unrecorded. And our understanding is the Albion plantation, which was owned by the bonds, was next to the Lancaster plantation. And they actually were it became incorporated as part of the same estate. Um, so details of the huge windfall of approximately £2 million in today's money received by John Bond for compensation for the freedom of the enslaved people he inherited from his uncle can be tracked on this British Legacies of Slave Ownership database. In total, £17 billion package of taxpayer funded compensation was paid to former slave owners in Britain. It actually took British taxpayers 182 years to pay off this debt. Uh, indeed, the loan the government took out to compensate slave owners for the abolition of slavery in 1833 was only repaid fully in 2015. Um, Okay, the slave owners received compensation, interest on the compensation payments and a further period of forced labour under what was called apprenticeship. Um, so the estate owners got to held on to their land and still could use the enslaved people on it to work for free for a further period of years before they were actually formally freed. The enslaved people themselves received no compensation. Um, Indeed, some descendants of those owned by British people, uh, as enslaved people, would later become British citizens and will have contributed in their own lifetimes through taxation to the huge windfall received by the same slave owners who once owned their descent ancestors as property. 
the legacy of this injustice has been vividly brought to wider public attention by the recent Windrush scandal, which has seen the descendants of enslaved people who came to work in Britain in the 1950s, deported from the UK many years after their arrival. And what you can see on this slide is from the registers of enslaved people um, that were held, um, I can't remember um, off the top of my head when they began taking these registers, but it was in the uh, very early 19th century, they started taking uh, annual or biannual registers of, of the enslaved people in British colonies. And we can see here a register for Lancaster Plantation uh, in Burbese owned by John Bond. Uh, and a list of the people that John Bond held. Now, the names of the enslaved people would um, norm ordinarily be given by the slave owners or managers of the estate. They, these weren't names that were freely chosen, but I still think it's important for us to see the names and to hear the names of these people. And we can see quite disturbingly John, but one of John Bond's um, people okay. working on John Bond's estate is actually called Lancaster. So there is someone called Lancaster, age 15, and someone called Liverpool, age 15, um, who is owned by John Bond of Dalton Square in Lancaster, who is mayor of Lancaster. Now, John Bond never went to, as far as we know, ever went to these plantations that inherited himself. Um, he, they, um, he owned the plantations, most of them in Guyana, with someone called Thomas Rawlinson from a branch of the Lancaster Rawlinson family, who were also up to their eyes in the slavery business. And um, John and Thomas uh, Rawlinson employed someone called Josias Booker uh, in 1815, uh, who's the son of a miller from Overkellet, a, a rural village many of you will know about 10 miles from Lancaster. Um, and they employed him or Thomas Bond uh, and Thomas Rawlinson employed him to work as a plantation overseer or manager in Demerara and Berbice. Uh, and by the time that Thomas Bond died and handed on his estates to John in 1818, Josias was managing and acting as attorney on Bond's uh, cotton plantation called Broom, Broom Hall in Guyana, and he started to assume a significant social status in the colony. Um, now, so though these are so uh, um, the, the Rawlinsons and Bonds at this point are absentee landlords, and Josias Booker and later his brothers, who he takes over to work with him in Guyana what are the ones playing the central role in the management and development of these overseas plantations for the next decade. In fact, in 1829, Josias was awarded a gold medal by what's called the Royal Society of Arts, which is known as the RSA today, um, for his improvements on the Bond and Rawlinson estates uh, in um, Guyana. So he'd written a very long account of how he'd introduced technology to improve these estates, um, such as um, a horse plough. Uh, and this was a piece of propaganda, effectively, that argued that the methods that he'd introduced had uh, were, were treating the enslaved people in a more humane way uh, by reducing, reducing their labour on the plantations by introducing new oxen-driven ploughs and cotton gins, which he imported from Lancaster. The oxen-driven plough has been imported from Caton, um, to the plantation. You can read this report online, um, but the evidence in it is deeply contested that the plantation regime was becoming more humane. Uh, in fact, we know from both contemporary accounts and from historical accounts uh, later that actually conditions on plantations are deteriorating. The planters and the slave owners know that aboli uh, abolition is coming and they, you know, in a way conditions start to deteriorate uh, due to market forces and, 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 and due to the fact that they know the end is in sight. They're trying to make as much money as they can in this last stage of uh, British slave ownership. Next slide. So here's some evidence of conditions uh, in Demerara from a reverend called John Smith who arrives in Demerara in 1817 and, and took up a ministry on a, on a plantation. 
near to the ones owned by and managed by Lancastrians. And his, his diary entries from the 1820s describes conditions on cotton plantations there with workers being perpetually flogged, the whip, the whip used with unsparing hand and people confined in stocks for the slightest infraction. He writes, ever since I've been in the colony, the slaves have been most grievously oppressed a most immoderate quantity of work has been generally exacted of them, not accepting women far advanced in pregnancy. When sick, they've been commonly neglected, ill-treated or half-starved. Their punishments have been frequent and severe. And this correlates with evidence we have from cotton plantations in America and sugar plantations elsewhere in this historical period and I can direct you if anyone's interested to research and the research evidence on that. Next slide. This brings us to the Demerara slave revolt of 1823 because it was this very reverend, Reverend Smith, uh, who was charged with complicity with enslaved people in this revolt. So one thing to understand about colonialism in this period and plantation economies is that enslaved people continuously revolted and rebelled in small ways and sometimes in very large and significant and organised ways, such as this 1823 revolt. And this Reverend Smith from England was condemned to death by the local government uh, in British Guyana to death by hanging. He actually died while in prison. But you can imagine the outrage in Britain in hearing that uh, this preacher, uh, this uh, person who'd been sent to, you know, humanize the colonies by providing ministry and education to enslaved people was now uh, committed to, to be hung uh, for his uh, alleged involvement in this revolt. Um, should, Amy, I can't remember if you're meant to be reading this bit or me. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to continue and say something about the Demerara Slave Rebellion? So the Demerara Slave Rebellion um, featured about 10,000 people um, and it started in the success plantation which was owned by, um, I think Imogen will go into later detail about this, um, by a man who was the father of one of the future prime ministers. Um, and this image depicts the punishment of slaves um, convicted of participating in the 1823 slave revolt. Um, and according to the accompanying explanations, one on the upper right, you have Quamina, um, who was on success plantation. On the upper right, you have Lindor on La Bonnet Intention. Um, on the lower left, you have Paul on the friendship um, and two heads of the middle walk of the plantation, um, New Orange Nassau. And on the lower right, you have Telemachus and Jemmy on the bachelor's adventure. Um, and success plantation is not attached to the Bond family. But actually, if you look at maps, um, you can see that they're very close. And there's probably only two or three plantations between them, which means that there's a good chance that those working on um, the aforementioned Albion plantation or Lancaster plantation would have known about what was going on, um, particularly considering that they would have shared um, sort of the church and the ministry together. Well, we know we know they know because in one of the contemporary accounts of the of the uh, revolt, Lancaster plantation is named as a plantation where the where there is fighting uh, uh, happening. So so this uprising began, and and as Amy said, it was led by. Um, a man um, who, who was owned by um, John Gladstone, called Jack Gladstone, and his father. Um, so they rose up, um, allegedly supported by Reverend Smith, um, against uh, the conditions, and um, about, as Amy said, 10,000, 13,000 people from an enslaved population of around 75,000 people. Um, were, got involved and this lasted for about two or three days uh, that they what they did is they surrounded all the planters houses they put the overseers in stocks they seized guns and ammunition they didn't actually kill any of the colonists um, and in the, and um, they wanted it to be peaceful in that respect um, 
but they fought um, and they, you know, they met resistance and they fought, um, you know, pitch battle to try and uh, gain their freedom. But it was brutally crushed. And as this horrific image, which was uh, made by somebody who was in um, the area at the time, these etchings show uh, Kumana, who was the father of Jack Gladstone, who um, worked as a deacon for Reverend Smith. Uh, who was, was captured and hung, uh, and many of those who participated were decapitated and their heads were used to warn others. Um, and this happened across slave revolts um, in, in uh, the West Indies, that this horrible display of the bodies, this barbarian display was used as a kind of warning to others. Uh, we can always talk more in the questions. I feel like we're brushing over a lot of detail, but we're giving you a taste of, you know, the connect that how people who were owned by Lancastrians. And the other thing I've not said is that John Gladstone, who was the father of Williamson Gladstone, was an EMP for Lancaster for a year. So these are people, these are deep connections to Lancaster, multiple connections to Lancaster of enslaved people in plantations. And, and here we have uh, enslaved people uh, rising up against the oppression. Amy. Um, so William Edward Gladstone, um, who was the son of John, would be the largest beneficiary from the taxpayer funded windfall, which accompanied the abolition of ownership in Britain in 1833. And the amount that he would receive for 2,508 people that he owned would be the modern day equivalent of 80 million pounds. So that's eight zero million pound. Um, William Gladstone's maiden speech in Parliament in June 1833 was in defence of the interests of the West Indi Indian plantation owners and specifically sought to defend his father and his family's reputation in the wake of the 1832 Demerara revolts led by the enslaved Jack Gladstone and his father Quamina. So the, the Demerara Slave Rebellion is memorialised today and there's a memorial that was erected in 2013 in Georgetown in Guyana. Uh, there's also a street uh, named after uh, Carmina, who was born in Guyana. Um, so we actually know uh, unusually something about his origins, uh, his African origins as well. Um, so the, these events are commemorated in Guyana, but of course they're not commemorated in Lancaster and perhaps they should be. Um, that's one of the things I think we're interested in is doing this reparative history to say, how do we commemorate this lives? Now, Kwamina, who, who was hung, but Jack Gladstone, the authorities at the time during the rebellion decided when he was captured, not to kill him because they thought he would be, be heroicized. They actually deported him to St. Lucia and sold him uh, on in, uh, into um, slavery. Uh, what we also know is that these slave rebellions in Demerara um, helped, did help um, put huge pressure on the British government towards abolition. Um, so they did have an impact, a political impact here. So um, I want to talk very briefly before I end up, uh, go to questions about uh, Josiah Booker. So we mentioned that actually the plantations are not being run directly by the John Bond who's inherited them or Rawlinson, his co-owner in Lancaster, but they're being managed from Lancaster via the, the, these young men they've employed from the Booker family and one of them, uh, Josiah in particular. Now, Josias Booker and his family remained plantation, became, you know, they went there to work there for others, but became plantation owners in their own right. Uh, in fact, after um, abolition, you know, these plantations were seen as unprofitable. These, they, they, you know, the people who got the compensation became millionaires and they often sold on their plantations to people who were resident there. Um, who, who thought they could still make money out of them. And the Bond family, uh, the Booker family is one such family. 
Now they did own some enslaved people uh, themselves. So the Booker brothers submitted claims on 52 slaves that they owned, making about half a million pounds in today's currency. And they used that money to extend their land holdings in, in British Guyana. And to, um, they, with those land holdings came this unpaid indentured labor force because people weren't immediately free. They had to work in indenture um, for a few more years before they would become free. Um, so actually for British Guyana planters, they use the abolition of slavery as a kind of opportunity to extend their holdings. And the bookers were at, at the forefront of this. And their enslaved workforce grew to 315 people in the period immediately following emancipation. Uh, they got four more years unpaid labor out of this labor force before they had to free them. And in this quote, you can see George Booker writing uh, a letter to his brother Septimus um, about um, today, you know, when he finally has to uh, let the, the enslaved people free on the estate um, in 1838. Now the Booker family grew to hold a monopoly in sugar plantations uh, in, in Guyana and they sold their holdings eventually to a partner called McConnell in 1880s so it became Booker McConnell but the name Booker uh, basically came to dominate sugar industry in Guyana until the 1970s so they, they, they became the sugar uh, plantation owners. But the name Booker's most famous today from the Literary Prize that they helped found, the Booker Prize, but also Booker's uh, Wholesalers, which has been bought now by Tesco. Uh, so these names are still circulating um, and are still kind of considerable arts and business um, names. When the writer John Berger was awarded the Booker Prize in 1972, he, in his speech, he drew links between the historic role of the Booker Company in the exploitation of generations of people in the West Indies and Caribbean and the persistent and enduring poverty and exploitation in the region today. As he stated as a revolutionary writer to share this prize with people in and from the Caribbean, people who are involved in a struggle to resist exploitation and eventually to expropriate companies like Booker. So our Booker's from Overkellet, who were all buried in, many of them in Overkellet still, and you can go and see their graves. And that's one of the things we've been doing in our research group with the community is looking at this family and their ownership of land and property in the local area, you know, are deeply implicated in the history of Guyana um, and as a nation and its emergence as a, as a post colony as well. Next slide. This um, is, so, uh, sorry, Amy. <laughs> no, please. Go on. Okay. Um, in Guyana, some of the plantations that were owned by um, families such as the Bonds and the Rawlingsons still exist today. So in this picture, you can see the Albion Sugar Estate, which was one of the plantations owned by the Bonds. Um, and in 1976, the government of Guyana nationalised and merged the sugar estates operated by the aforementioned Bookers um, in the Booker Sugar Estate Limited and the Jessels Holdings to form the Guyana Sugar Cor Corporations, um, which you can abbreviate to Gaisuko. Um, the This is one of the largest sugar plantations to exist today. Um, I'm currently undergoing research on it and it appears that they hold tours that people regularly visited pre-COVID. Um, and it has over 50 square miles um, with 20 acres of sugar cane under cultivation. Its sugar processing factory has a grinding capacity of 170 tonnes of cane per hour. And the whole enterprise um, employs about 4,000 people. Um, while Imogen was, okay, Imogen, would you like to talk about your research um, in the blog? So when, when I, we were looking at this, you know, where these estates were today, so Albion now includes this former Lancaster estate and it's now, you know, sugar, not cotton. But while we were researching it, um, 
we found out that the workers at the sugar estate went on strike uh, because they're protest protesting the conditions under which they were working during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and they went on strike about unsafe working conditions. So it's interesting to think about, I think, the continuing histories of labour struggles in this area. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to end with two stories which uh, to illustrate why these histories and, uh, are important today. The first is a story that you can look up. Um, it's a story by, of somebody called Ali, Malik Al Nasir, who was born in 1966 in Liverpool. He's a British author and performance poet who was born to a Welsh mother and a Guyanese father. And Malik is actually now doing a PhD on this history at Cambridge University, where he's been given um, a scholarship. Now, Malik um, basically started doing his own family tree. Um, you know, he'd experienced unbelievable racial abuse growing up on a council estate in Toxteth in the 1960s and 70s. You know, he, he talks about how he was put into the care system, how he, the N-word was used against him, how he was told to go back to where you came from. So he suffered a lot from racism in Britain. And then he came across a documentary in 2002 about black footballer in, in, Scottish, in Scotland. Um, um, and he, he started, who was called uh, Andrew Watson. And he started to, his mum said he had some connection to this footballer, this black footballer who's in these images here. And he started to research the history of this first known British black footballer and how, uh, whether he was connected to him, and he was indeed connected to him. And it took him to Guyana, this story, and, and to an understanding of his own history as a history both of the enslaved and slave owners. So he, as a descendant of both uh, enslaved people in Guyana and slave owners, uh, in particular, um, a huge company uh, a Liverpool-based company um, who owned many of the sugar plantations in Demerara and actually went back to uh, Demerara and Berbice and, and researched and, and found relatives who still lived there um, who were relatives of the slave owners um, and the enslaved people. So I do suggest you have a look, Google him and look at his amazing story. He's also on Twitter and he's, he's fantastic. And the second story to end with is a story that came out of our own research um, in Lancaster Black History Group. And this is um, a man called Richie um, Booker, um, who's known as a DJ. He's known by the name Richie Brave and he's a DJ, Radio One Extra DJ. And he contacted me after reading a blog that I put up just after the Black Lives Matter protest about preliminary research in this area. Uh, and he contacted me and he said he could, I could share this with you. He said, my actual name is Richie Booker. I'm a direct descendant of the African people enslaved by the Booker brothers in Guyana. I knew her for a bit, but I learned quite a bit more from you. I can't tell you how much it means to me. Um, it's quite an emotional process when you're so close to it and you have the surname as a branding and a reminder. And I've uh, promised Richie that I'm going to work with him to try and do some more on his own family history to understand that connection to the Booker family from over Kellett. And um, so I've been corresponding with him. But I think those two stories, in a way, bring the history to life and its meaning and its importance for understanding how these hidden histories and surfacing them relate to both contemporary Britain and contemporary Guyana. And um, that's it. Um, but I suppose, I think what we're trying to do is say that this, what I call global history matters, local global history matters. Lancaster, our Lancaster, Lancaster in Guyana, at least there are at least two, if not three, Lancaster Plantation, um, Lancaster Village today in Guyana, and at least two men owned by Lancastrians called Lancaster. And making these connections and surfacing them matters. Okay. 
Okay, so really happy. We're still recording. Um, but really happy to take any questions from anybody to me or Amy about any parts of the research we've been conducting with Lancaster Black History Group. There's a lot of information we've stuffed in <laughs> to a small amount of time. And um, I know that Victoria is going from the Sewing Cafe is going to put lots of links in uh, or has put links in the chat for people to follow up on some of these stories to find out some more information about them. But we're really happy to also to answer any any questions you might have about the story we've told today. So I can see Diana has got her hand up. You, um, can you unmute Diana? <laughs> thank you. I just want to say thank you, Imogen and, and Victoria and Amy. Thank you so much. Gosh, what a lot of detail. And I just wanted to, there was a slide on the um, memorial of the Demerara, Demerara Rebellion. Um, and the words said that it was led by Gla Jack Gladstone. Is that, have I understood that right? And whose father was Kamina? Uh, well, there are, there are different versions of, of the revolt. So Kwamina worked as a deacon for Reverend Smith, who I mentioned. So Kwamina had become quite a significant person in the community and he'd become a deacon of the church. And most accounts of this history suggest that he was slightly more reluctant about the rebellion than his son Jack. So he wanted desperately change and him and Reverend Smith talked about how to bring change, how to bring freedom um, because of the horrendous conditions. But Jack was a younger man who was his son, obviously Jack Gladstone, um, who was, um, and most accounts suggest that he led the actual uh, an organised rebellion. He, he, he had quite a lot of freedom too relative. He was a carpenter. He moved between estates and plantations. He had a relative amount of, of, of uh, mobility. Um, so they were, they were both in it, uh, but there are different versions of who was leading it or who was behind it. The authorities, you know, obviously felt Reverend Smith and Kwamina were behind it. But other accounts suggest Jack Gladstone, if you like, was the activist or organiser on the ground. Oh, I see. I, well, I think I was confused because of the connection with the with um, William Gladstone. So, what's the connection there? So they were owned by John Jack Gladstone. Was owned by John Gladstone. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, and and Kwamina also is sometimes given the surname Gladstone mm -hmm. because he was owned or formerly owned by John Gladstone who was the father of William Gladstone. Yeah. It, yeah. Thanks very much. And it begins the revolt on Gladstone's estate, yes. on John Gladstone's estate, which is a huge political embarrassment to John Gladstone uh, because he's been claiming, you know, that uh, the enslaved people on his estates are treated humanely. Yeah. And yet we have this huge rebellion uh, that begins on you know, begins from his own enslaved workforce on one of his estates. And John Gladstone's a Liverpool-based slave owner and merchant, but he's got these strong connections, as, as have all the Lancastrian merchants, to Liverpool, uh, becoming a Liverpool um, a RMP in Lancaster for, for a brief period. Wow. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca? I'm just having to slide along to look at names. So if I'm not getting you in order, I apologize. Hi, um, that was amazing, really. So interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not much sleep, so this might not come out as like a cohesive thought, but something that really stood out for me, which I think we still do in Britain, is we have no awareness of our footprint on the world and the kind of damage we do. Like, we know a bit, but the, the details that you presented are really painful and emotional. And I'm just trying to think how Lancaster Black History Group, how we can kind of bring that in more, like you said, that there's no memorial here about the kind of things that we see over there and how we do that as a group so that people recognise that 
we are Lancaster is a is a global city but we're massive and, and kind of a lot of people here know that but I don't think the wider community do and I don't I don't know how we start to to teach people that because we need to because we're making the same mistakes over and over again so not really a question but something for us to think about I think yeah that, that's a really good question because it's come up through some of the research the community groups that uh, Sunita has been leading and, and, and many of us have been involved in so one of the conversations we've had with the a group from Lancaster Girls Grammar School who've been working on William Lindo who was a plantation owner in St Vincent and a slave trader uh, and up to his eyes in, in every aspect of the slavery business, is how would a school, you know, not only begin to teach that history in its curriculum, but perhaps try and make links with the places and schools in places where uh, the, the con were connected to historically through the slavery business. So, you know, when you go through, drive through a village or town, it has a plaque that says, we're, we're, we're twinned with, and you always think, why is we twin with that place in Europe normally? In a way, it would be a new way of thinking about twinning, where perhaps schools or groups could begin to connect with other community groups and schools in the places that we've surfaced these connections with and to do forms of kind of co-learning and exchange with those places. So it's one of the things we've begun to think about as a kind of decentering and, and trying to work in, in a global way uh, with, with groups uh, that we meet through the research overseas. And we have had help from researchers, you know, the Boys Grammar School group has had a researcher in Jamaica helping us go into the Jamaican National Archives to find, to understand the links between one of our Gregsons and a plantation in Jamaica. So we've actually had help using social media, making these connections uh, to people already, but it's way to how we might cement that into, into, into relationships. I think that's part of the reparative process that we are engaged in, but uh, ideas welcome in that space. I'm just trying to see, there's not a way for me to see uh hands i can see lots of uh it says andrew gibson but you don't look like an andrew i'm just being polite <laughs> no uh emma thank you very much um i mean my mind is blown it was really powerful and um so i can't i can't thank you enough um and i just i have one little question but just to make a couple of um uh comments really and uh, I'm I am a, a descendant of um, a Suffolk man who went to work on a plantation somewhere, and I know that because I my neighbour did some ancestry work for me, and um, and on my nan's side there was um, a woman who was born in Demerara. I now you know I have no idea where Demerara uh, was at all. Um, and um, and she was born in 1835 and her father went out obviously before then and will have done one of these jobs that we've been yeah. talking about. So um, um, that sort of puts it right into a, a sort yeah. of context. Um, and when I, uh, so when I first thought, oh, you know, where is it and what, why would he have gone there? Um, I, um, um, found out it was in Guyana and put that into, I did a couple of searches and one was Wikipedia. So this is like rubbish research compared to yours, which is why yours is just so wonderful to hear. I mean, wonderful in a, in a, in a, you know, very um, complex way. And, and I also went onto a, a BBC sort of fact finding site about Guyana and neither of them even included the 1923 rebellion. So it's not even there. Now, that is quite shocking to me that you could do a search on Guyana history and not find it in somewhere like the BBC. So that's like, um, uh, you know, yeah, shocking. Um, and I suppose I think the power of what you say, we were walking through the beauty of Caton and, you know, having fantastic views yesterday. And that story about the Booker family and, and taking plows out to the plantations you know it just it it does absolutely 
blow your head off, doesn't it? Um, so my very small question, and it really is um, um, just a, a, a little one, is I will, obviously you will have read Joshua Bryant's account of the rebellion that was published in 1824. Yeah. And you said that George Booker was a subscriber to it. Yeah. So having not really read it, I just wonder, so was it a, a pamphlet that was written sort of in a way, you know, I'm thinking there's two options. It was either saying, look at this terrible thing that happened, we need to abolish slavery, or was it saying, look at our brave troops that defeated this? Much more of the latter. Much right. more of the latter. Right, right. I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, you... So when you're researching this history, what you realise straight away, you know, is is who's you've got to think all the time who's writing the account and why. What's this is a political context in Britain, where you know everybody begin knows really the John Gladstones know that abolition is coming. Yeah, they know that they've only got a limited amount of time, and they're trying to eke out that you know to try to to stop it happening, pause it, slow it down. Um, so they can make as much money as they can in this last period. And so, I mean, an account like that is a sort of, it's written for, you know, it's a way to take control. Taking control of history is really powerful, isn't it? <laughs> you know, take it's a way of taking control of that history in a way. Um, I can't remember exactly. Brian is living there and visiting there, and it's an account he's written through a process of subscription it's a bit like uh, crowdsourcing today you know people have subscribed right. for his account and all the people who've subscribed are the planters and owners you know so it's their account if you like of what happened mm -hmm. uh it doesn't mean it spares you know but um you know it's not we don't hear the voices of the people who participated in it and that's what's so hard about these histories that even the names of the people who participated are names that have been given to them you know their surnames if they have them are very often the names of the owners their, their christian names are names liverpool manchester you know the names of the places mm. that you know hold uh, have got an affectionate place in the managers or owners lives or connected to their histories um, so it's how to tell these histories in a way that starts to give humanity and dignity and place to the roles of the enslaved people and to center the resistance against uh, the, the conditions but that's absolutely I would love to talk to you if that's all right about your family history because I'd be really interested I think, you know, there is, there's, there's some really important, so Alex Renton has just published a book. Um, I don't know if you could put that in the chat, Victoria, but it's an account of somebody telling the history, you know, doing his family tree, finding out that he's a descendant of a slave owner and telling that and doing that history. This is our white history, as well as the history of, of this. We have to all work together on these histories and I think the reparative part includes all of us um, so I think it would be fascinating for you to 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 do some more work on that and I'd be happy yeah, to help you with that yeah lovely can. Uh, Imogen can I just ask something quickly it is Andrew Gibson now yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. just just out, just out of interest just just looking at the names of the the enslaved folk with uh, I noticed obviously one of them was called Bond and, and I wondered if there is any evidence of when somebody was called the family name, it was because they were seen as special in some way or they attained positions that other people didn't attain or were favoured in some way. I just wondered if there's any evidence of that. The answer is I don't know. Um, I think or it's too complex to give a single answer to yeah. that. Okay. I mean, it, I mean, what you have to understand as well is that sometimes, you know, these will be uh, the children of mm. the plantation managers or overseers themselves, you know, and they'll know that sometimes, well, the slave registers are really complicated, but you can sometimes see uh, in the way the slave registers are made that there's a sort of acknowledgement of somebody's of mixed ancestry who's parent or father's probably white 
Mm. Um, so it's really complicated, um, the naming. Um, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't answer in an authoritative way, so it's better if I don't, don't try. I'm going to mute us again, so someone else, but I'll, I'll ask Victoria on the email for your email, Imogen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's fascinating. Thanks for sharing that story. Anne Morgan. Hello, Imogen. Can I just say thank you very much? I thoroughly, well, the word I, I was going to say enjoyed. I didn't enjoy it. I found it quite emotional in at times, and uh, I just want to thank you for sharing that. I noticed on one of the etchings of the way the uh, slaves were treated after the rebellion that uh, one of the plantations was called Friendship. Now uh, that, as a Quaker, that struck a chord with me. Uh, and I just wondered if you knew any more about that plantation. As you know, I've been researching the Lancaster Quakers uh, relationship with all of this. Um, and I'm actually I'm at the record office tomorrow for a whole day digging into our archive further. But um, I just wondered if you'd got any, any greater knowledge about that particular plantation. I don't, Anne. I've got a vague memory that that was a Dutch name that was right. translated into an English name, but I, I, I'd, I'd have to look for you. I can have a look and um, okay. see what I can find out. So, okay. so some of the plantate, they all had Dutch names originally, and then some of them became, were newly named, and some of them, they translated the Dutch name and some of them got a new name. Um, but I don't know if much work has been done on plantation names as such no. as well, which would be interesting to, to, to look into. But no, I don't know. But yeah, you're right. I found another one that I haven't been able to trace called Quakers Hall, which is fairly emphatically about to do with Quakerism. But I don't know whether but I can't find any more information about it at the moment. So uh, if I come across anything Quaker related, I will pop you an email. <laughs> very <continue>. great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you for all your work. Okay. Uh, I just said, because you've got Simon Stewart here from the Cornerstone Group and, and Sunita, who's been leading that group as well. So just, I don't know if they want to um, add anything. I um, just wanted to say thank you so much. This is the first time we've had one of our, our researchers presenting, Amy, um, with support from Imogen. So it's just, um, you know, so special um, to have this. And uh, we want to thank the Sewing um, Cafe, especially Victoria, for organizing this because all of these things require time and effort, publicity. So for, you know, thank you to everyone who's come along today. Uh, but thank you especially to the presenters and, and to Victoria. And, and Victoria is recording this, so she will ensure that it's um, sent out to, to um, ev everyone who's interested, because I know people from the group that work with Amy weren't able all to come today and they would very much want to, um, to see the recording. Um, so just wanted to say thank you to, to you. Um, every time you present, we learn something new. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you, Amy and, and the Cornerstones group who've, who've been doing amazing work. I mean, Amy's work on the will, which I've been trying to help her finish translating on Thomas Bond's will is just in itself such an important part of our history in Lancaster. It's like a 14, is it 14 pages, Amy? Yeah, about that. And it's, you know, that we've, you know, she's done an incredible, painstaking job and it's taught us a lot about how the money that's flowing in from Guyana uh, and Grenada from Thomas Bond is being used to enclose land and buy property here. Uh, and also the money's being invested in the canal, in local schools, in the, lo what, the local infirmary. Um, so we can start to trace in a way how the history of Lancaster um, is being, you know, the civic history and its welfare estate is starting to be formed through the money from these colonial links. Now, understanding that, I think, is really important. 
Um, so, you know, it's because of the work of the community research that Lancaster History is doing, because it's so painstakingly hard to do this work, as Anne will know, that we're beginning to piece together much more detail about these connected histories um, so that we can own this history and, and collectively, which I think is just amazing. And I've, I've been really enjoying working with Amy uh, one to one as well on this work. Uh, Geraldine. Before we finish, you can have the last word. <laughs> um, again, just want to say thank you. I've been writing notes down, if you couldn't tell. Um, and I think for me personally, when you hear the stories linked to the slave trade, you like only get one narrative. And as a black person, I used to think, but what did they do? What, what was their response? Because the stories always insinuated that they took it, they accepted their fate. And just to hear another version that, this wasn't the case and bring these stories to light and making it relatable to Lancaster because I think you know Guyana is so far away but using those links and you know your glo global knowledge that Lancaster yes it's a small town in the northwest but we have these links um, globally and we are trying to show these links and hopefully the information that you collated and researched in your groups will be embedded in the schools and so it won't just be you know won't leave a legacy so I just want to say thank you for that basically to everyone and we'll be back um Victoria is it next week uh anyway we'll be back with the next uh, cafe and we, we hopefully will continue these cafes that are a chance for us to collaborate um, you know with, with the sewing cafe which is amazing and we can't wait to see what they produce from this but also I think these these sharing events are really nice thing for us to do uh, out of the community uh, the slavery family trees and the community research we've been doing um, so thanks everyone for coming <laughs>